Good morning. We're excited to worship with you guys today. Let's sing. Oh, Lord, my God, when I ain't awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great! Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place this morning. I pray that as we lift up these words, our worship is pleasing to you. God, help us to be receptive of the word you have for us this morning. God, we're here for you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your presence. Thank you for Jesus. We worship you now. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. In all my failures, I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You call my name.
God did for them, especially when they were in Egypt. I mean, there for 400 years. And finally, crying out, you know, God listens and sends Moses to get him out of Egypt and all the things that went on with that. But, I mean, he went through the Red Sea, parting the waters, got out into the desert, fed him with manna, needed water, they gave him water. Clothes never wore out and everything. But here's a part of the story we sometimes miss. Before they left Egypt, when the Egyptians didn't want to let them go, God said he would cause the Egyptians to give the Israelites gold and silver and jewels and, and so many things that they wouldn't need. So when they left and then God gets them out in the desert and he says it's time to make a tabernacle, they had all the material they needed to do that. They had skilled workers to make all the things they needed. Now what was their worship? 400 years of slavery, I'm wondering what their worship was like if they were worshiping God. They were crying out to him, but were they worshiping? But with all the things they experienced, you think they would have worshiped. And what I want us to understand is we have people today that ask you, well, why do you give to the church? When we're really giving to God. And here's the point. When God asks us to do something, he provides. He provides whatever he asks you to do, and we tend to forget that. He's always working, and, and we miss it, and we need to see that. So when we worship, whatever it, he asks us to give time, he asks us to give money, he asks us to give skills to help somebody, to promote, let people know about Jesus Christ and the love he has for them, he's going to provide. And I know during worship, we don't pass offering plates anymore, and that was a reminder that it is part of worship. We just have boxes on the back wall to put it in. You can do it online whatever your choice is but it is part of what God asks us to do, it's part of our worship to recognize him, to honor him so let's be praying this morning Heavenly Father we just thank you that you love us, that you provide for us, you're always there caring for us and we are here to worship you because you always have and you always will and we just want to worship you this morning because you're such a loving and giving God in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Good to see you, church, and those watching online, thanks for joining here this morning. Before I dive into it, uh, uh, a couple things I want to share with you. We're going to be starting a new series today. It's going to go over the next five weeks. I'm excited about this series uh, by Andy Stanley. Uh, we always do a fall campaign, and that's what we're kicking off here. And just a reminder, the way that we end that in six weeks is, well, we, we do a service Sunday. And so service Sunday is going to look completely different because we gather here at eight o'clock and we go out and we serve uh, the community for four hours, come back in here for a potluck and then, uh, you know, celebrate how God uh, used us that day and, and everything and just have a wonderful time of celebration. And uh, so again, uh, if you probably this week have been contacted by one of the staff members saying, hey, how can you help out on service Sunday? Um, and we'll be continuing contacting you and, and finding out about that uh, as when it comes to that and getting ready for that time definitely and because we're like only like six weeks out uh, that we're going to be doing that and again if you know anyone with projects we're putting those projects together uh, so if you let us know that if you're watching online um, and and you have a project get a hold of us call us this week uh, we'd love to help out uh, uh, with that and and so we're excited about that uh, uh, you should have been handed an outline uh, when you come in uh, that you can kind of fill out and follow along if you're plugged into a small group you specifically want to fill that out because they're going to be using that and bring that to the small group if you're not plugged into a small group we want to plug you into a small group uh, as we go through this and and uh, do that and we always we love our small groups here and and uh, what they have to offer there's two that meet on Sunday night one on Monday night one on Wednesday night one on Thursday morning and and so here at the church and so there's many opportunities if you'd like to get plugged in this week get a hold of us and we can let you know more check us out or go out uh, to the next step station uh, that's out there and while you're there make sure we have your contact correct contact information if you haven't been getting people say Dave I hear you talk about these emails that you send out all the time about letting us know you know if it's a men's event women's event all church event things are happening but I'm not getting those emails or I'm not getting those text messages then if you can make sure on your way out you stop at next step if you haven't gotten that and would like to get some of that information Stop there and make sure we have all your correct information because I have been known to make a couple mistakes 
once or twice a year. And that might have been plugging in your information. So I encourage you to do that. But like I said, I'm excited as we start this new series, and it's called Brand New. Uh, like I said, from Andy Stanley's book, Brand New. And, and as we started off, I want to share this little story that I heard about this this guy who owned a mom and pop grocery store. And this one guy that, was, uh, that came in all the time to the store, he was, just, he was just so impressed at how this owner was just always so intelligent and so smart and, and knew so many different things. And he went up to him and says, tell me, Mr. Green, what makes you so smart? Mr. Green kind of looked at him and says, well, I usually don't like to give out my secrets, but since you're such a loyal customer, and he leaned forward and he said, this is what helps, fish head. And the guy looked at him and said, what? Eating fish heads is what makes me so intelligent and so smart. Fish heads? Yeah. Okay. So he went over and bought four of them or so. And he took them home. And he came back about a week later and stuff. And he was mad. And he said, I've been eating these fish heads. And number one, they taste horrible. But I'm not any smarter. And Mr. Green said, you haven't been doing it long enough and eating enough. So the guy went over and he bought 20 more. And he was gone for a couple of weeks and he was eating them. And he, and, and he comes back in and this time he's really, really angry. And he says, Mr. Green, you're selling me fish heads at $4 a piece. When I just found out I could buy the whole fish for two bucks, you're ripping me off. And Mr. Green said, see, you're already getting smarter. I'm going to let that sink in for some of you a little bit longer with it and stuff. But no, as we start this new series, this brand new series and everything, I hope by the end of these five weeks, we all are a little smarter, not because we ate fish heads, uh, when it, but we're a little bit smarter because we have a better understanding of what Christ meant when he first came and was teaching the people and started something that was brand new, what he meant by having the church. And what the church should look like. But, the, you know, and, and that can be difficult because it's always changing when it comes to the church. I mean, 21 years ago, I was blessed to come and be the senior minister here. And, you know, when I came 21 years ago, it was different. I mean, we were at a different location. And thanks to some strong wind, that changed our location. But we met in a different building. Things looked different and sounded different. You know, I, I came where, and every time I got up on Sunday morning, sometimes it was a suit and tie, mostly just a tie that I would preach from. And now you got to put up with this. You know, and things have changed. Our service has changed. Our service times have changed. How we do service, the music sometimes that we sing in service. You know, all that's changed. And not just us. It's, it's changing for churches everywhere. I mean, you know, you walk into some churches, you go to their children's church area. It looks like Disneyland. You know, you walk in there the way you have it set up. Or or you come into some auditoriums and everything, and, and it looks like more like a concert event, you know, than what we call a sanctuary. And, and so there's been change, and there's been great change in, in churches, ours and, and many churches uh, around the world. And in, one of the things that Andy points out is he says, it's not that those things were bad there in the past, but, but a lot of the change he feels is, is help people that are out there questioning God in churches kind of helped a little bit to allow them to want to come in and maybe experience you know, what church is and, and, and what it's about a, a little bit more who really aren't into the whole church thing uh, when it comes to it. But here's what I want us to be talking about today specifically, but over the whole five weeks. With all of this change, with all these programs, well, how the church looks different today than maybe it did 5, 10, 25 years ago, with all this cool stuff, with all these amazing environments, we are still holding on to things that hold us back. We're still holding on. The church, even with all its progress, we continue to hold on to things that hold us back from being who God wants us to be. I mean, if, if you're an unchurched person, if you're watching right now and, and have been offended or frustrated with the church or whatever, or don't like the church or, or from that aspect with it, you know, I, I hope you'll stay with us through this series. Uh, or if you know people, I would encourage you to plug in and have them watch and have them join us uh, because I think a lot of the things that they dislike, that people dislike about the church today are things that the church should dislike about the church today. And I think that we would probably agree with a lot of the different things that. So we're going to talk about some of those things. I think it's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be a little bit emotional maybe for some. And some of you might even get a little bit upset, but that's okay. Welcome to church, you know. And, and, and I want to think about it from this way as we go through this. Think about it from an outsider's perspective. Somebody who doesn't call themselves a follower, a believer in Christ. Jesus hasn't given their life. Just somebody on the outside looking in. What is church to them? Think about it. What would church be to them? And it's just a community of people that are gathering together, right? A community of people that are getting together to talk about a guy who we believe is more than just a man, 
but they would say just a man that came and lived at a certain time that tried to tell us about God and how much God loved us and, and, and show us that there is a way to get connected with God. That's what church is to them, all right? So what's there to resist about that? What is there to resist about that? I mean, you don't have to agree. You don't even have to like it. But you shouldn't dislike it unless there's more to it than that. I mean, think about it. What did Jesus teach? Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, love your enemies, all those great things. You know, pray for those who persecute you, all that. So what is there to resist about that? In fact, there should be nothing. Absolutely nothing resistible about the church except one thing. And that's our loyalty to Jesus Christ. That's our loyalty. I mean, for the first roughly 300 years the church existed, the primary reason that the church got persecuted in those first years was was the fact that there was a king, Caesar, and the Christians said, well, that's nice, but he's not our king. We only believe in one king, and that is Jesus Christ, our king. It wasn't because of the music that they sang. It wasn't because they were weird or judgmental or put people off or were exclusive. That isn't why they were persecuted. There was these people that there are, or there was this kingdom that was set up and there was Caesar, there was Nero. They, you know, we are this king and all this other stuff. And the Christians are like, hey, that's, oh, that's nice. But Jesus Christ is our only king. And they didn't like that. And it didn't play well. But yet in those first three centuries, the church still grew. Because as frustrated as people were about the loyalty that these crazy Christians have towards this guy named Jesus Christ, as frustrated as they were, it's the thing that they loved about these people that were there. It's the thing that drew them into the church to be a part of the church because of, wow, of this Jesus. And look at how loyal they are. I mean, now take all of that and think about today. Think about today. What would it be like if the only thing people had to say bad about the church was this. And you know what? Those people that go to church, they're awesome. They're great bosses. They're great employees, employers. You know, they're great neighbor. I hope my son, I hope my daughter marries one of them. They are such awesome people, you know? But, ah, I just can't handle the fact of the way of their extraordinary devotion to Jesus. What would that be like if that was the only complaint that we had? See, I don't know about you. I've been in ministry a couple days, and, and over my years of ministry and talking to other ministers, being at conferences, talking to other leaders of churches, leaders here with it, I've never ever heard that reason, excuse for why people don't come to church, why people don't like church, why people resist. There's thousands of other reasons that people will come up, and, and actually, those aren't reasons, they're excuses, I'll be honest. Thousands of other reasons, or excuses, I can say it, that people choose to resist church, but it's never because those crazy Christians just love Jesus so much. I can't take it. You know, I, I, I never ever hear that, you know, when it comes to it. And it's, you know, I'm sure that, that there are many church leaders or, or there are many churches out there, you know, that maybe they've heard that. But the thing is, I want us to understand is the church should be irresistible except for the fact that we believe Jesus is the Lord, the Son of God, okay, when it comes down to that. And again, you can resist that, but anything else about us that's irresistible, maybe it's something we need to get honest and resist ourselves. Andy Stanley, uh, and talking about, he was sharing how him and his a couple of his family members and some friends and their family members had the chance to go over to China and, and, to, and to tour China and was going through there. And while they were there, they were going through some factories and, and stuff and seeing some things that were made for us in America. They saw stuff that you could go into Lowe's and Menards and, you know, these big box office stores and they saw it being made there. And, and one of the tours that they were having, the, they, the gentleman that was the tour guy came up and said, can this young lady, can she shadow us, please? Because she needs to learn how to give these tours as well. And of course, they were all like, sure, they can follow us. So about roughly the next two and a half or so hours, they go through this factory, and then the CEO comes out at the end, and, and the CEO is telling them a little bit more about it and, and this kind of stuff, and, and, and uh, he asks if there's any questions, and Andy said their group asked some questions, and then he says, any more questions? And all of a sudden, this young lady, for over two and a half hours, they haven't heard a word. She goes, I have a question. Kind of caught them all off guard, Andy said, and so they looked to her, and she didn't have a question for the CEO or anybody else that was there from China. She looked straight to Andy, and she said, you're a pastor, aren't you? And he said he was caught off guard a little bit. He was like, uh, yeah. 
She goes, well, I have a question. Why doesn't everybody in America go to church? And she said, he didn't know what to say. That's not what he expected. And after talking with her for a little bit longer, what he found out was this young lady had grown up, you know, and, and not known God, but at several years before this, somebody had given her some information, some sermon material. She had read it. She had listened to it. He had given her a Bible. She came and heard the truth, knew the truth, and she surrendered her life and became a follower, believer of Christ. But to go to this state-governed church, it was so far away, she couldn't get there. And to the churches that we call underground churches and stuff, it wasn't safe. And they moved around, and they were very hard. So she couldn't get to church on a consistent uh, uh, consistently with it and she loved church and she missed it but yet she heard in the united states that there was almost a church on every corner and in some communities there is a church on every corner and that and she heard that christian americans not all americans but those in america that call themselves christians don't go to the church don't go to church she couldn't figure out why she said why wouldn't everybody want to be a part of a community that loves one another that forgives one another who wouldn't want to gather with people to celebrate the fact that they've been forgiven who would want to gather that way? Who would want to celebrate with other people and gather with people to celebrate what they can learn about God and continue to learn about God? She just had no category in her mind, no way that she could wrap around why Christians in America would choose not to gather and not to come to church. You know, Pastor, why wouldn't everybody in America attend church? And Andy said, I could not answer her question. Literally, I couldn't answer her question, he said. But then Andy continues to write, and he says, afterwards, I got really, he says, of course, I got thinking the rest of the trip and all the way home. He said, who doesn't want their life, I thought? Who doesn't want their life to be better? And who doesn't want to be, live a better life? And then he also got thinking. He said, you know, the reality and the truth is this. If you just took the teachings of Jesus... You maybe, maybe you didn't want to go as far as believe he was the son of God, okay? But you just decided to take his teachings, love the way that I've loved, love one another and do those things, you know, pray for those who are persons. If you just decided to take those teachings and just live out those teachings each and every day, you're going to have a better life and live a better life, period. Whether you accept him as your Lord and Savior, that part is just something that's even, uh, you know, makes it even better part of it. But if somebody were to, and who would not want that? She had a great question. Why doesn't everybody in America that call themselves Christians make it a priority to get and go to church? How did we become so resistible? How is it that there are things that people say about us and the reasons they don't like us have nothing to do with the fact that what we believe that Jesus is ultimately our ultimate authority? Where'd all that other stuff come from? And here's what I hope we're going to discover starting today and through this series, that we're going to discover that the resistible factor is not the result of new things over time that have been added in. They're old things, old things that got brought back in. It wasn't like somebody came up with this new idea, oh, we need to do, and let's add this into it. It was old things from the past. And, and Andy uses a term that he brings in to try to help people understand it. He calls it the temple model. The temple model has been around, I mean, it goes all the way back to Egypt, Assyria, the Babylons, Persians, Greeks, Romans, the Jewish Empire and everything, all the way up to literally today. The temple model, he said, is what it makes us resistible. You see, the temple model has basically four parts to it. It has a sacred place, it has sacred texts, it has sacred people, and it has sincere followers. So you have this, this model that, that, that's there where you have a sacred place and somebody in there, they house or have these sacred take text that somebody gets up and teaches and talks about and everything and these sincere followers that follow and they'll say listen you have to follow this or do this or or else this bad will happen or this good will happen if you do and it's still alive today anthropology says in what they call uh, uh, anthropologists call mud hut regions you know and you go out to these different undiscovered or these people groups uh, that are out there you can still find this set up with it you go to it and 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 the most powerful people in some of these groups are the shaman or the witch doctors 
You go to their place. They don't have walls around where their hut is, but people are terrified to go there with their skulls and everything. It's a sacred place. People are scared to go into that sacred place. And these witch doctors or shamans, they will have these spells. They have these book of things that they will do if, you, if you're sick that they will cast upon you, this thing that they will do here, or if you have a relation, whatever. And so they have these texts that they follow to help you live your life, that you can do these things. And they tell you what to do and how to live it. And, and if you do these things and stuff, you can be cured or find or whatever along those lines. So we have it at that, and we have it all the way to the other end of it that we see as well, the other side of the spectrum, where you look like in places like Syria and Iraq. We see sacred places with sacred texts, with sacred men interpreting these sacred texts, asking people to do things that we think are horrendous and are affront to God. But in their minds, but in their minds, they're being consistent to what they've taught, being taught by these sacred men who control and interpret these sacred texts. And I believe what we're going to discover is much of this temple thinking is alive and well in the church as well. Because I know as you're sitting there listening to me describe these times, you're thinking, isn't that us? Isn't that exactly what we do? We come into this sacred place and we have this sacred text called the Bible. And we got people like you, preacher, that stand up there and tell us what those sacred texts say and that we better do it. If we don't, this is going to happen. And if we do, this is going to happen. Isn't that what we do today? Yeah. We kind of are running the temple model at all of our churches in America, you know, that we see there. And it isn't the temple model way that, that most churches are run. Yeah, they are. They are. So what we're going to discover in this series is, I hope is, if you'll stay with me, if I haven't already stepped on some toes and that, but is the, that even though the temple model has trickled into the New Testament church and its gathering, we can still learn what God wanted us to be in our life. You see, there's some things that because of Jesus' arrival that have changed. First thing is this, the arrival of Jesus signaled the end of what we just talked about, this whole temple model that I've sent this introduction up here and talked about. And not just for the Jews, but for everybody, okay? I mean, if you remember, at the end of Jesus' ministry, you know, he's with his followers and he says this, hey, I know you love Jerusalem, and I know you love, you know, your people, the Jewish nation and everything, and, and, and you've seen a lot of things, and I want you to take this truth, this good news, the things you've seen, I want you to take it to your local people, to teach them, encourage them, challenge them, and train, but it doesn't stop there. I want you to take it to everyone, to the end of the world. Everything you've seen, everything you've heard, because this message is for every man, every woman, every child, everywhere. It's the beginning of something new that's there. You know, there's going to be no more sacred places. And that was hard for them to grasp. And we still hold on to those sacred places today. I remember when um, several years ago, Lauren and I and uh, John Reside, uh, who was at our church at that time, you know, we had a chance to go over to Israel and spend uh, some days over there with 50 other guys. And I remember one of the places that they took us. Uh, we got to go to Caesarea Philippi, and we're standing there. We're standing there where uh, they, they have this, Col and that's not a Colosseum, but, you know, the, this kind of like it, uh, this Colosseum, and at the bottom of the platform, there's this mosaic tile, and right there in that exact spot as we stood was the exact same spot the Apostle Paul stood as he defended his faith before these people that were sitting in this auditorium. And I was like, whoa, I'm standing where? The guy who wrote a good hunk of the New Testament. I'm standing where the Apostle Paul. I mean, that's a wow moment. And we take places like that and we make them sacred and, and, and understand why they can be important. And it's okay to have those wow moments at it. But what we have to understand is because of what Christ has done and doing away with this temple model, there are no sacred places. You know what the sacred places are now? Look to your left. Or you're right. Look at the people that are here. You are. When we give our life to Christ, when we enter the waters of baptism, we come up out of there, this new creature, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We become God's temple. We are the sacred. And God says, look it. There is no place, no dirt around on this big ball of dirt. There's no place that you stand is more sacred than who you are because of what my son has done for you. You are sacred. And the sacred text, the Old Testament, and everything Jesus would say, you know, that's been fulfilled. So because of this, Jesus not only did he do away with the temple model, but he predicted a new movement. Again, he's talking to these guys and, and as they're on their way to Caesarea Philippi, and he's talking, hey, we know who Caesar is, who this has been named after, and everybody knows who Caesar is and what Caesar is. But he asked his disciples, remember this? Who do people say I am? 
And they start saying, well, some say you're Elijah, and some say you're this, some say you're that. And he says, well, that's cool. Who do you say I am? And Peter comes back with that, well, I'll tell you who I think you are. I think you're the Messiah. Remember? You're the one we've been waiting for. That whole testament points to you. I think you're, you're the Messiah, the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you're exactly right. And you didn't get that on your own. You got that from my father. And this is what his, here, here comes his prediction. And then Jesus said, and I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, rock being the, declara- the declaration, the statement he just made, you are Christ, the son of the living God. On this, you are the rock. On this, I will build my future church. At that moment, he announced the beginning of not a sacred place in that, but something new, brand new, that was going to come out, this new movement that was going to be there, you know, this new gathering of, of people, this ecclesia. I'm throwing that Greek out there to you. You know, the Greek and the Hebrew, we call it the ecclesia. You see, William Tyndale, he actually interpreted it correctly. You know, congregation is what that means, just a gathering of people. Several years later, some smart people said, we need to get together and we need to actually use uh, the German word, which actually means house of the Lord, specific place or sacred place. So we're going to use the German word and in place of in the New Testament. And that's where we get the word church. And that's why when we think of church, we think of a place or, or a space or a sacred place. And Jesus said, no, I've come to end all these sacred places. And I'm going to build a congregation, a gathering of people. And I will be with them wherever they go to spread my good news. And then he instituted a brand new covenant. And that word covenant simply means arrangement. You know, this new arrangement with God. Before the covenant, you know, they had their old covenant that was there. They had the high priest that had to go before them, remember, had to do everything. They went in the high priest. The high priest is the one that met before them. And he says, now I'm establishing a new covenant. The old approach to God, it's over. Regardless of religion, whatever name you have on that, now I'm making it so people can go directly, directly to God because of the final sacrifice that's about to be made to known to you. And when he gathered with his disciples toward the end of his ministry, remember, this is what he said, in the same way after supper, he's in the upper room with him. He took the cup saying, this cup, they had no idea what he's saying. I mean, they had no idea what this means. He's showing them this. This is brand new. You know, he took this cup. This cup is the new covenant. And you can imagine, remember, they're human just like us. They're like, we already got a covenant you know, we know we already are in a covenant. Why do we need a new covenant? And Jesus would say, tonight I'm going to establish a brand new covenant in my blood. What? You're not, you know, believe, what? You know, confusion, but then they saw him hang on the cross. They watched his blood be shed on the cross, and eventually it dawned on them. This is the final sacrifice for the sin, not just for us good Jews, but for all mankind, a new covenant. And then Jesus introduced a new meaning a new meaning to these texts. Again, he was teaching, and again, we read the English version, and we read the Bible devotion, and these kinds of things, and I think sometimes they slip by us because we're 2,000 years removed, but the day when Jesus said this, I think possibly the crowd may have went silent because these are the kinds of the things they try to stone and kill him for saying. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. He's talking about the Old Testament. Don't think I've come to abolish them. I've not come to abolish them. I have come to fulfill them. Again, for us, cool. For them, he just told them, you know everything that you've been in synagogue to, all these years of studying that you've done? You know all those prophecies? Yeah, point to me. You know all those things that you do at the temple and all that sacrifice stuff? Yeah, me, me, me. It all funnels down to who I am. It's all about me. That's some brash statement to be making to these people and what they're hearing, okay? The Old Testament was simply this directional sign, pointing sign, and it directed to me. I mean, 20 years later, Paul, I think, you know, I think he knew it before that, but he would later say he was right. It was like this entire Old Testament was like a tutor that we needed to understand. And now that he's come and done this, we don't need the tutor because we have a Savior, a Savior that was there. And then he instituted a brand new movement defining ethic. See, again, if you grew up in church, you've probably heard this a thousand times, but for those people, this was so significant. He gathered with his closest followers and he said to them, a new command I give you, love one another. Okay, you're giving me this new command to love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. And when he said, as I have loved you, you must love one another, 
They knew exactly what he meant. Why? Because what had he done just before this? Just before this is when he got up and threw threw the towel and everything wrapped around him, grabbed some water, and knelt down and washed every single one of their stinky feet, sweaty, smelly feet. And they were so uncomfortable. I mean, these are the hands, these are the hands that took spit in the mud, made mud, put them on a guy, and he was healed. These are the hands that went up and touched a leper, and the leper were healed. I mean, Peter was so offended and so uncomfortable, he said, uh-uh, you're not washing my feet, Jesus. Remember Jesus' response? You know? I mean, today we go, like, paraphrase it. Sit down and be quiet, Pete. All right? Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, you'll have no part of me. Oh, Lord, then wash not just my feet, but my hands and my head alone, if that's what it takes. Uncomfortable. See, don't miss this. Jesus did for them what none of them would do for each other. We forgot that, church. Jesus did for them what they would not do for each other. He got uncomfortable. He humbled himself. We don't like those two words in the church. And as Christians today, if we're going to be true disciples of Jesus and followers of Jesus, you're going to be, we're going to be uncomfortable because Jesus asks us to do some things that are uncomfortable. He asks us to do some things that we have to humble ourselves. When you look through that, this is this new movement he brought in. These are the things that got him killed. People didn't like to hear this. It made him uncomfortable of what we wanted to do, but it, 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 it's, it's what our movement is supposed to be. It's why those, like I said, they didn't like, they didn't like that they wouldn't bow down to Caesar as king, but those first, second, third centuries, it's like, whoa, look at how they love. That's just so irresistible. I, I don't understand. I mock them and they love me. I, I humiliate them. They forgive me. They bring me into my house when, what, how could, I don't, their devotion to Jesus is so whacked out and I hate it, but I love it at the same time. They do things that are so uncomfortable, so humiliating, but they do it with such joy in their hearts. How? I, I got to have me some of that. I hate it, but I got to have me some of that. It's so irresistible. I got to go see what is there. This is the new movement that Christ brought into the church. They got him crucified upon the cross. They got him crucified. And then he said to them, and by this, what you just experienced, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love the way I just love you. If you love that way. Man, that's tough. You see, my friends, I know there's a place in the Bible, I'm pretty sure I studied it once, that said that there is a battle between the spirit and the flesh. <laughs> spirit and the flesh. See, you've heard me say this in my 21 years of preaching here. How many times have you heard me say this? this the, the flesh. There are three people we love. Who are those three people? Me, myself, and I. Man, we love those people. And there are things that we do as those people that the Spirit says, no, that's not right, that's not good. You shouldn't. And the Spirit's over here saying, this is what it means to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ. You love this way. You humble yourself. You wash dirty, sneak. And the flesh is over here saying, I ain't touching no feet. That's way too comfortable. You know, I'm not doing it. And there's this battle of spirit and flesh daily. Why do you think the scripture says, pray continually? What are you praying for? That I can do what the spirit tells me to do, not what my flesh tells me to do. It starts to make sense. The word of God and how he has it weaved together for our instructions that are there. And then... He does something that really floors him. He gave a new meaning to Passover. And this was, wow, this was the clincher, my friends. I, I tried to think of things that, uh, to illustrate this and reading through Andy's book and, and listening to him as far as that aspect goes. And uh, the way I came up with illustrating it is this. Uh, most people know who Billy Graham is, okay? Uh, you might not know who Andy Stanley is, who we're doing this series after, uh, but you, most people know who Billy Graham is, Okay. So, and we know that Billy Graham has passed. Now, say that all of a sudden you wake up tomorrow, wherever you get your news feed from, watching on TV, reading your newspaper, whatever social media branch that, uh, you, know, you look at, you saw that our government made a law that this year we're going to finish out Christmas like we normally do. 
December 25th, we're going to have Christmas and celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. But because Billy Graham is such an awesome guy and did such awesome things in here, starting in 23, no more December 25th Christmas, we're going to celebrate Billy Graham on his birthday instead of Jesus on December 25th. How do you think that would go over? Would you like it? If that was a reality, what you would be feeling is exactly what they're feeling right now when Jesus says, I am bringing you new meaning to the Passover. When he gets up and he talks about this, wait, 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 pa we've had this Passover for like 1,400 years, Jesus. I'm not sure, you know, <laughs> I mean, come on. 1,400 years we've celebrated how God has delivered us, how we use this man named Moses. You know, Jesus, Moses, I'm, I know you know it, Rabbi, you know. And, 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 and he's done this thing, and he's delivered his people. And, and, and now you're saying you want to bring new, you want to change. It's no longer going to be. I mean, we've been with you for quite a while now, Jesus. We've gone through a lot. And right now, there's not a lot of people, a small hand group of people that, that are liking you. But come on, you know? Yeah, that Lazarus thing was pretty cool. But we're talking 1,400 years of tradition of Moses delivering his people. You ain't Moses, Jesus. And who have you delivered? <laughs> you can almost hear the humanity in them as they speak and as they share, you know, when it comes down to this. But that's why Jesus was trying to help them understand, yeah, this isn't the temple model 2.0 I'm bringing you here. This is something 100% different, brand new. The old has come, oh, the old is gone, the new has come. And the arrival of Jesus signaled the end of the temple model and the beginning of something brand new brand new. And after the resurrection, the ascension, the church got off to this amazing start. But then there are some temple thoughts, some temple mindsets, you know, that started to blend into Jesus' thinking and conscience. And unfortunately, much of that temple thinking is still a part and has still worked its way through the centuries into the church today. And for most of it, it's the reason we're, I think we are unnecessarily resistible. But I hope we can figure that out. I hope we can figure that out. And the worship team is getting ready to come up here as we spend some time and we remember through these emblems of what they mean to us. And, and, and I hope in these next five weeks that you will continue to come and to gather and to learn. And, and, and we're going to let go, I hopefully, of things that maybe have been holding us back to do our best by God's grace, you know, to, to re-embrace or fully re-embrace what Jesus had in mind when he said, this is something new that I want to bring. Not a knockoff of Judaism, something completely brand new. And hey, it's for everyone. It's for everyone out there. But you'll have to catch up with next week to see how that goes and follow along uh, with it. But right now, I just want us to spend some time and, you know, just praise God for his son Christ. Praise God for this, uh, this newness that he did bring to spend some time and maybe ask for forgiveness for the temple model maybe we've trickled into our lives. You know, ten fingers pointed here. I know there's been ways that I've let it come in and, and been challenged over the years at different times and, and, and that and, and maybe, you know, spend some time and, and just say, hey, God, how, be praying. How do I need to make sure that, number first and foremost, number one, I'm right, but also that we be who you want us to be uh, and, and, and live that out each and every day. We're going to come forward here, take the emblems, go back to the seat and sit and, and spend some time in prayer, letting God speak to our hearts, you know, so we can understand and make sure we're being the church he wants us to be. So let's do that. Let's spend some time in prayer now. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you sent your son Jesus and what that means in so many different ways that we were reminded of today. The change that was brought, the newness that was brought, the celebration. I thank you for the hope and all that, that these emblems represent within our lives, Heavenly Father. And as we partake of them now, Father God, may we celebrate and give thanks, Father God. But we also, may we remember, Lord, may we remember what you brought new. May we remember your words, what you've taught us. So when we walk out of here, that's also how we are living, Heavenly Father. Thank you for this time that we can examine our hearts and our lives, that your Holy Spirit could come in and speak to us and examine and help us examine our hearts and lives so we can make sure, Father God, that when we go out from this building, we are your congregation, taking your word everywhere, every day that we go, knowing that you are with us, guiding, leading, and directing. Thank you for that truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Till I 
Father, we thank you so much for newness in Jesus. As we leave this place, I pray that you can help us to understand that you're a God that desperately wants us. So God, help us to fall in line with your vision for us this week. Help us to understand that you're present with us in everything that we come up against. God, you're worthy of our worship this morning, tomorrow, every single day, every single moment. So help us to be worshipers this week. We love you. We thank you for your love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, thank you for being here this morning. We hope that you were blessed. Have a great week.